Welcome back to the Speaking and Communicating Podcast. I am your host, Roberta. If you are looking to improve your communication skills, both professionally and personally, this is the podcast you should be tuning into. And by the end of this episode, please remember to subscribe, give a rating and a review. This is a communications and public speaking podcast. So my guest today is exactly the perfect fit because he is a public speaker, a public speaking coach, and the award-winning author of The Captivating Public Speaker, which is a book that shows you how to engage, impact, and inspire your audience every single time. My guest, Peter George, is joining us today in the show. Please help me welcome Peter. Hello. Hi, Roberta. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you, Peter? Very good, thank you. Pleasure thank to you be for here. Being here. I'm so excited about our conversation. I get excited every time somebody is a public speaker. <laughs> <on the show. laughs> I bet everybody can tell. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what makes it interesting to listen to as well. The enthusiasm. Mm. Right. So before we get into all your credentials, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where in the US are you based? I'm in Rhode Island. And for people who <laughs> don't know where Rhode Island is. It's in between Massachusetts. It's just south of Massachusetts and north of New York, a couple of hundred miles north of New York. And we're the smallest state in the Union, and uh, we're known for the ocean. We're right on the ocean, beautiful ocean. I grew up here. I've lived other places, but I've always come back mm -hmm. because it's so beautiful. And, uh, and I grew up with a lisp and a stutter in the capital, Providence. And that's why it's ironic that I do what I do for a living, that I'm a public speaking coach and speaker and the like. Mm -hmm. Because when you grow up with a lisp and a stutter, you don't think you're ever going to be speaking for a living. Of course. You know how they say focus on your strengths to make your life a little easier? Yeah. It's intriguing that you were having those challenges and yet this is the career you ended up having. Yeah, when I when I got into the corporate world, when I got out of school and got into the corporate world, uh, I had to present. I had no choice. So I went to get help. I went to get training. And what I realized at that point was I had been learning about communication throughout my life by avoiding it. I'd see when it what was happening and know I didn't want to get involved. So even if it was from the other side of the coin, if you will, mm -hmm. I was still observing it. And then when I got that training, I was realizing I know exactly what's going on here. I know what the perspective is from the other side. So it really lent itself to helping me become a more effective communicator. That's interesting. So first of all, when you went to the corporate world, what, what career were you pursuing? I worked for Sony Corporation in marketing. Mm -hmm. And the great thing about marketing is you think you can stay in a, an office and and come up with ideas and and uh, provide information and the like, and that you won't have to speak to people. But, but I that found out that wasn't is? the case. <laughs> <laughs> isn't that isn't that why we channel surf so much? Because all these marketers are selling us stuff on television. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it it turned out well. And then when I left the corporate world, and I left because my dad died, so I came back to Rhode Island to be with my mom. Uh, I had to decide what I wanted to do with my life because I just left a job of a lifetime. So uh, I went into business for myself, been in business for myself ever since. And being able to present and present fairly well did nothing but increase the revenue of my companies. Mm. The more I spoke, the bigger the bumps were in our revenue. So when you were doing the marketing job, did you still have the list and the starter? No, they really were gone by the time I got to high school, more or less. They still okay. They still come about every so often, especially the stutter. If I'm tired or if I'm speaking about something that's truly near and dear to me, mm -hmm. uh, that's heartfelt, you, my stutter will come back. Right. It's funny that you talk about how communication skills have improved your business there's a quote, and it's actually in your book, The Captivating Public Speaker by Brian Tracy. You know, he's from the generation of Zig Ziglar, Brian Tracy, Jim Rohn, and we, used, we grew up listening to them. And he says, if you learn communication skills, 
they will improve your business and your personal life by about 80%. Yep. It's amazing. You look at Warren Buffett. Mm -hmm. He's done okay for himself over the years. <laughs> if he hadn't given away a lot of his fortune, he'd still be the wealthiest man in the world. The world. Mm. Every investment he makes is scrutinized, analyzed, torn apart piece by piece. And people want to know, should they make a, a similar investment? Should they not? And so forth. Yet he'll say the most important investment he ever made in his entire lifetime was his investment in his public speaking. Of course. He took a course when he was 27 years old. He said because he knew back then that if he couldn't communicate well, he wouldn't be able to lead and achieve what he wanted to achieve. Lead, which is a big word. We talk about leadership and leadership coaching a lot on this podcast. What is it about communication that is such a key part in being a leader? Well, you ha people have to know what you mean. They have to know what's expected of them, what you're trying to accomplish. All that has to be clear. And when we leave it up to people assuming or people guessing at what we want to achieve or our, our object objectives are or whatever it might be that we want to do or have them do or the direction for a company or an, uh, something we're trying to accomplish, if that's not clear to them, then that's where mistakes come in. That's where discontentment, because that's what you told me. No, that's not what I told you. Yes, it was, comes in. All these things happen. And ultimately, no matter what it is and to, to no matter to what degree, what needed to be accomplished wasn't accomplished or wasn't accomplished as it should have been. Mm -hmm. Speaking of clarity from a leader, you know, there's performance reviews and one of the in one of the cases a leader was heard saying to his so what should i do to be better you know to improve and so that in the next review even the areas of improvement i've done better in them and he says you could be more confident and the subordinate thought i have absolutely no idea what i'm supposed to go and do when i step out of his office exactly that happens so often and communication and, and clear communication is essential. And not everybody has it. And I can give you a story about someone I worked with, and she was thrilled when she got promoted. Mm -hmm. The problem was when she then had to present in front of the C-suite, she didn't do a good job. And when everybody left an hour or so later, the only one who remained other than her was her vice president, the one who had given her the promotion. And he said to her, get better or get a new job. Because it made him look bad. He's the one who promoted her. The problem is we don't assess communication skills till they're needed. And sometimes those people don't have the communication skills. I didn't. Then I was hired for college, something. Unless you are pursuing a communications degree, no? Exactly. I never took any type of comm class. So who knew who knew I was going to need it? But once I got to my position, I did. And they hired me without assessing if I had that skill or not. Mm. Now, I, I built that skill. And they're the ones who sent me to get that skill built up and develop it. But we assume people can communicate until we find out they can't, whether that's the written word or the spoken word. And so many of us rise up to a position and then they, and we like, I can't do this. I don't know how to do this. And that's why I say when you increase your public speaking skills, it's a power skill. It's not a soft skill. Neither is leadership. Those are two really? of the most powerful oh, okay. skills you can possibly have. And when you have them, that'll help increase your impact, your influence, and ultimately your income. That's very true. Yes. And then somebody listening might be thinking, you know, you sound very courageous. The fact that you even, you know, stuttered before and you decided to pursue this. But what about tons of people who always think I'm so afraid to speak and stand in front of people and speak? The spotlight being on me, my nerves, or if I forget something, what are people supposed to do with their nerves? Well, first of all, everything you just said just proves they're human. Right. Show me the speaker who hasn't forgotten something. 
I do. I do. We all do. <laughs> I, 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 for a lot of reasons, I wish Martin Luther King would st still be around, but he being one of the speakers of our generation, mm -hmm. I would love to say to him, what did you forget in I Have a Dream? You probably had some things you forgot. Yeah, most of us sit down and say, now a lot of what they do, especially nowadays, is on teleprompters and everything else, but they still skip them. They look away and come back and it's gone. Mm -hmm. And of course, we all sit down and go, oh my God, I skipped the most important thing. You know what? It probably wasn't. So we all forget something. We all get nervous. I've been doing this for 35 years, speaking on stage. And I still get nervous, but that's not, I don't look at it as being nervous. I look at it as being pumped up. It's adrenaline. It's, it's exciting. just how we label it. Are mm -hmm. we labeling the adrenaline rush as nerves or are we are labeling the adrenaline rush as being amped up? I choose to be amped up. It's the same feeling going through your brain and your body. So I choose the positive one. I still think, think to this day, if I say, no, I'm nervous, then I'm not going to do as well. I won't feel the same. But when people are, unless it's clinical, which there are some cases, certainly, okay. but unless it's clinical, most of us are not afraid of public speaking. I don't believe we are. I believe we're afraid of uh, screwing up somehow. That's it. In of front being of strangers. Uh, yeah, of being judged. And, and even if they're not strangers, our peers, even worse. Yeah. These are the people we see every day, the people I, I'm going to have to look up from my desk at and see or be on the next Zoom call with. Oh, my God, what if I screwed up? But what's the big deal? We all do. And no one's expecting perfection. They're expecting connection. Don't worry about being perfect. You're not going to be. None of us are. But work on connecting with your audiences. And there's a variety of ways to do that. Mm -hmm. But take the onus off yourself. We all hear, what if I screw up? What if I make a mistake? What if I forget what I'm going to say? What if I can't connect? It's I, I, I. It shouldn't be I. Focus on the audience. Now you're there to help them. And when you help people, that's a completely different feeling than I have to look perfect in front of people. When we're yeah, you know, I was in the hospital not too long ago for an emergency surgery. I really didn't care if the doctor's uh, uh, clothing was perfect. Couldn't care less. You just said, save my life, no matter what it takes. Couldn't care less if he shaved that day. Mm. Didn't make a difference to me. He was there to help me. So when you're there to help people, it's a completely different feeling. They appreciate the help. And Roberta, you're an expert in this. Think about it. Who wants a speaker to fail? No one. No. Nope. No one ever went to a class. Think of a college class. You go to a college class, first day of the semester. No kid ever walks in and goes, man, I hope this professor is terrible. I yes. hope he's monotone <laughs> and boring. And that's no. the way I want to spend the next three months. No, we pull for the, the speaker. We want them to do well, even if it's out of self-preservation. But we want to get what we're there for. And therefore, the speaker has to do well. We're pulling for that speaker. I say that all the time. The audience is rooting for you. Oh, they want you to do great. They're rooting for you. Yeah. It's, but then it's, if somebody... Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, it's not like the, the jerk in the audience at a comedy show going, I'm going to heckle this guy. I'm going to make him screw up. I'm going to... <laughs> it's not like that. <laughs> no. It just isn't. I mean, we have that idea in our head and the and the great comedians know how to handle that they mm -hmm. deal with that almost every night but people are there for you you're there for them how can it go wrong but sometimes it does go wrong sometimes you get thrown a curveball there's a story from your book that i please i would love for you to narrate where there was they were about to introduce you and the guy was introducing you forgot you know his notes on saying everything about you and then there were people talking in the kitchen. And when you walked out, uh, somebody had a question and say, are you a public speaker or a public speaking coach? Yes. And then somebody screams, please, can you tell that story? Because I absolutely love it. Yeah, I'll keep it clean. In the book, I use the actual words, but I'll keep it clean. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yeah, it, it was just like you said. It was at a presentation I was doing for an organization and I always provide the person who's going to introduce me, in this case, it was the executive director, with my introduction. 
not a bio, which a lot of people do, but an actual introduction. Mm -hmm. And I actually go over with whoever's going to introduce me. I go over the introduction with them. These are the words I want you to hit, to emphasize. This is how I want you to present it. Because it's when you're introduced correctly, it actually becomes the very be becomes the very beginning of your presentation. Right. And I play off that. So the f and then I always keep a copy. I usually have a jacket on. I always keep in the breast pocket of the jacket a copy of the introduction because sooner or later you run into people who go, oh, I left it in the car, I left it on my desk, it's upstairs in the hotel room, wherever it might be. And I always have a copy. Well, I didn't know he didn't have his copy until he started speaking. And he said, well, you know what? I'll just wing it, which meant it wasn't going to be good. And it screwed up what would be the opening of my presentation. But mm -hmm. that's okay. It's not the first time it happened and I know how to handle it. So he confused the audience a little bit. And when I got up to speak, before I could start to speak, a guy raised his hand from the audience, which is extremely unusual. And the first thought that went through my head is, well, it's already messed up a little bit. What's the big deal? And I said, what's up? And he said, I'm a little confused. Are you a speaker or a speaking coach? And now the quick answer is both. Yeah. Well, during the introduction, I could hear over in the kitchen, and this was in a hotel in the ballroom, I could hear in the kitchen connected to the ballroom, people having a very loud and angry argument. And so I was half paying attention to my introduction being a little messed up and half paying attention to what they're saying, because that was very entertaining, what was going on in the kitchen. Well, when the guy asked that question, what are you? The door bursts open from the kitchen that connects to the ballroom. And you hear a woman in the kitchen yell, he's a, and a few expletives here, not nice person. And you can take it from there. Mm -hmm. And that permeated the room. Everybody heard it. It's 400 people or so in the audience. They all heard it. And you can't ignore it. So my first thought was, apparently there was a third choice. <laughs> and everybody laughed and everything. And when they calmed down, I just thought and said, you know, I never knew my wife, work my ex-wife worked here. Oh my goodness. That's the and, flashlight. <laughs> and they started laughing again. And it was what it was. And we had a great time after that. So, mm -hmm. uh, that was, and we really connected. I really, really connected with that audience. You could feel it. Yeah. And that was because of that whole little unplanned thing going on. So that you never know. You do amazing. get thrown curveballs. It's how you react to them that matters. That is amazing. And that's what I always emphasize because I had a guest who shared a story where the, the speaker was so, he's one of those, I want to do everything perfectly type of speakers and presenters right so the car alarm goes off if you are speaking in the car alarm right in the middle of your speech and the car alarm goes off what would you do because that's another another curveball well not a car alarm but i can tell you a story about an alarm oh okay i was speaking once and just as i got up to speak i was just starting to speak this was in a hotel as well mm. the fire alarm went off oh yes I remember. so we all got up and filed out and it was a false alarm. We all came back in. And when everybody got settled, I started to speak again. And off goes the alarm again. We all went back outside. Again, it's a false alarm. We all go back in. And by the time we went in, and I was supposed to speak for an hour, by the time we got back in, I had eight minutes left. I hadn't even really started to speak. I mean, I, I got two minutes worth. So at that point, I just looked at him and said, if I had an hour to speak, the takeaway would have been, and I gave them the takeaway. Mm. Because truthfully, that's the essence of why we're there anyway. Yeah. So my thought was, give them what they came for, which was the essence of the talk, what, what they were meant to take away. Mm -hmm. And that was it. So you handled that pretty well as well. Because with, with the story of the guy with the car alarm went off, and you know the noise it makes. Everybody can hear it. Sure. He carried on like nothing happened. And here's the thing. If you're in the audience, it's bugging you. And you are asking yourself, why is he not addressing it? Why is he not making a joke about it? You gotta why address is he it. asking, it does, does anybody know whose car that is? Does anybody know if they are, you know, the, 
whatever it is, but to completely ignore a noise that everybody can hear. I'm even wondering if do people then continue to listen to you or their minds yeah. are now on the alarm that you are not addressing? It's it's too difficult. So at that point, you all might as well. I don't know what I would do in that case, because a lot of it's done at the spur of the moment. But I mm -hmm. I think just like you said, I think I would say, does anybody know what car that might be? Could you check? I, I don't know, but you can't talk through it. Yeah, it's the ignoring for me. I'm not saying there's a solution or I have a better suggestion, but I don't think there's, just like you handled the scream from the kitchen that well, say something. It's the acknowledgement, I think, is 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 what the audience expects if, if you throw in a curveball and, and find a way to connect, have some fun about it. Yeah, you know, what's funny is after that happened, that was several years ago, I've often thought of other comebacks that I could have said, because I don't know why I chose to say what I said. It was just spur it was of the good, moment though. and said it, and it turned out to be fairly funny. Right. But, you know, was, I, I was thinking it, was, it could have also have been, now that's the way you project with your voice. You know, that type thing. There's so many different things you could say. Don't ignore it. Play into it. Those are some of the funniest things you can have. Right. And we're always looking, not always, but most of the time we're looking for some humor with the audience. People mm -hmm. like humor, not jokes necessarily. And I don't suggest jokes, but I do suggest humor. That's, that's provided up on a, a, a platter for you. That's perfect. That's, mm -hmm. it couldn't be any better than that. But many of us say, oh, if I'm interrupted, I want to ignore. No, play with it. Have fun with it. Or in the case of the alarm, you might just have to stop. Mm -hmm. Period. Who who knows? And that might happen. If I had lost my entire time, if it was a real fire, <laughs> the biggest that, that problem would have been I lost my time to speak. Yes. That, that people little... getting out of the place alive. Uh -huh. So you, you got to keep it in context. And when we get overly nervous, which is understandable, but when we get overly nervous, then we're trying to become calculating, I think, as opposed to just going with the flow. Go with the flow. Yes. That's very good advice. Now let's talk about when you are assigned a speaking engagement and the organizers of the event where they will put you on the agenda and you're one of the speakers. You know that phrase, people like working with people they like and people yes. who are easy to work with. Back to communication, what are some ways in which you can make sure that the way you communicate with people who plan events, you are cordial, you are polite and respectful, even if there's a glitch like you and I had, had our technical glitches before today. And because like you said, you, they want to recommend you in the future possibly, or even work with you on another event. So what are some of the things that you can be cognizant of when it comes to how you communicate with event organizers. I try to communicate with the event organizers the same way I communicate with the listeners in an audience. You're there to serve them. Simple as that. You're there to serve an audience. The meeting planners and the people who pay the meeting planners, the head of the organization, head of the company, whoever pays them, they're your audience as well. You have to satisfy them as well. So if you want to get along well with your organizer, which certainly behooves you and the audience, mm -hmm. then just simply ask, what can I do to make your life easier? How can I help you? Is there anything I can do? I, I'll tell a couple of stories and I'm not patting myself on the back here. It's just the way I was brought up. Right. My dad's been dead for over 30 years, but I think if I were ever a jerk to someone, to anybody, but like say an organizer, uh, meeting plan. I think my father would come up out of his grave and smack me. So you, you, you're there to serve them. And I said, I was going to give you an example. Now I can't think of what I was going to say uh, for the example. Right. I'll think of it, but just, oh, I'll give you an, ex I, I know what it was. I was speaking in Alabama once, many, many burning Birmingham, Alabama, many years ago for a company. And we were in a uh, a church gym slash stage area because it was the only thing that could fit enough people. Right. They didn't have the room in the where their offices were. And the person who was supposed to clean up never showed up. 
So I was the host. I was staying at the house of the head of this company. And he and his wife were there. And so at the end, I'm getting my stuff together. And he's folding up chairs, took off his shirt, uh, jacket, took off his tie, rolled up his sleeves. He's folding up chairs and his wife's sweeping the floor. And this man makes quite a nice salary at the head of this company. Hmm. And I looked at him. I said, let me help. He says, no, you sit there. And I said, no, don't be foolish. Let's the three of us do this and we'll get out of here sooner and go back to your house and relax. Right. And that's just the way I was brought up is just because I was the other person to speak. I was just another person there. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm I, I'm no great shakes. They can get a million other people to do what I do. So uh, and I just want to help people. So if that's someone in the audience or a meeting planner or the head of the company. Just help them. Just be pleasant. I ask for one thing. And I, I have friends in the industry who asked for a whole laundry list of things, including certain color M and M's, and like bring your own M and M's. Give you those. I I haven't been. I'm kidding. <laughs> so, I ask for one thing: a bottle of water for each hour I'm speaking. So if I'm doing a breakout and it's three hours, mm-hmm. or a workshop and it's three hours, I'd like three bottles of water. And truthfully, I'll bring my own if you'd like. But other than that, that's all I ask for. It's reasonable. Yeah. And. I, I just signed a contract for next March to fly out to California and speak for a company. And they said, what can we provide for you? And I said, clean sheets. I don't care if it's a high-end hotel, low-end hotel, as long, as long as it's clean, I couldn't care less. And a bottle of water when I speak. And she said, you've got to ha- want more than that. I said, that's, that's it. it. Clean, clean sheets, a shower and a bottle of water. And I'm, I'm a very happy camper. So just try to be a pleasant person to work with. You're there to help them. Yeah, they're giving you a check. Maybe not, depending on your arrangement, but but you're their guest. But still, when you go to a friend's house and they cook dinner and they're putting the dishes in the dishwasher or in the sink or cleaning up or whatever, don't you always say, can I help? Can I help? Can I help you guys wash the dishes, clean up? Just what we do. Yeah. yeah. Just be pleasant. That's all. Mm-hmm. it'll work out will things screw up like we did we have the technical difficulties it happens but right. so what if this is the worst thing that would happen in our lives today right that we had a little technical difficulty that was cleaned up in five minutes if that's the worst thing that's going to happen we're doing okay of course yeah <laughs> i've actually i've i've had recording that it was the third time lucky that we finally recorded <laughs> Yes, kept happening, and it's it's funny. She was so sweet, and I miss Susan more. She was so sweet. We became such good friends, and and she said, "I'll be back on this show again one day. We'd love to continue this conversation." So we didn't let the technical glitch, that curveball, throw us off. No, mm-hmm. okay, and come back with a smile again. If that's the worst thing, that's <laughs> that's pretty good. Right. So now let's talk about your actual speech. Yes, your actual delivery. You have what they call an M framework. Tell us a little bit about that. Amped framework. That's what I devise so I can work with my clients to show them the foundation they have to build to put their presentation on. So Amped stands for audience. Know who you're speaking to and know who you're speaking to intimately. Not only who they are, the demographics, all that stuff. Are they with a company, an organization, all from the same community? But what do they want to know? What do they need to know? When you research, when you speak to them ahead of time and ask questions, you find that out. How do you want to make them feel? A lot of speakers don't think about that. How do you want to make them feel when they leave there? Do you want them to be, uh, to use the expression, amped up? Do you want them to be uh, confident? Do you want them to have a fire lit under their butt? Do you want them to be able to accomplish something? How do you want them to feel? And then what are they taking away? What's the actual benefit? I'm a believer in transformation. Yes. When we speak to inform, we've made a mistake. And that's what most of us want to do. Speak to inform. That's easy. Uh, That's also something that can be sent by email in a PDF. But when we speak to transform, that's different. The audience leaves with something they didn't have when they came in the room. 
And that's a public speaker, someone who transforms someone. They gave them something that they didn't know that now they'll be able to accomplish something they want to. They reaffirm something they believed in, but to a greater intensity. They feel challenged. They, whatever it might be, don't speak to inform, speak to transform. So the amped with the A, finding about the audience is the foundation that you're going to build everything else on. Because otherwise, you're just guessing at what, how you should, what you should speak about. So that's the A. The message, the M is the message, a main point. What are you actually speaking about? Not the topic, but what are you actually going to say? I believe this, whatever that might be. I don't know. In the community, it could be, I believe we can lower taxes and, and still serve uh, even more, give more service to the community. And that's what you're going to expound upon. That's going to be your main point. Then the pre presentation is the actual presentation that you work on, your opening, your transitions, your three talking points, your sub points, your transformation statement, which tells the audience how you're going, how they're going to be transformed by your time together. Mm -hmm. Your concluding transition, which is kind of a restatement of the transformation statement saying, this is what you just learned. So it gives them a reminder of what they learned and what they're taking away. And then your conclusion, that's all the presentation. And that's very much the same if you're speaking to 10 people or 10,000 people. Works very mm -hmm. much the same. And the D in AMPT is the delivery. Working on your delivery, the rehearsal, putting everything together, creating your slides or props, working with those while you're rehearsing, but rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing. And a lot of people go, well, if I rehearse too much, it'll sound rehearsed. No, that means you haven't rehearsed enough. <laughs> rehearse more. I like the old actor saying, and I hope I get this right, because I, I mess it up more than I say it right. Don't rehearse to get it right. Rehearse till you can't get it wrong. Wow. And that yeah. means just what we were talking about before, Roberta, something goes wrong. You've rehearsed enough that you can come out of that, address it and get back to where you were. Right. I'm a huge, I'm a guitarist and I'm a huge Eric Clapton fan. And I've, went to see him for the 30th time last month. And this guy's a virtuoso. And there's a there's a gazillion of them out there in music, but he's a virtuoso. He can be playing a song and go off nowhere on a lead. And the band will just keep backing him up, playing the same thing while he's off on a lead going nowhere. And he comes back and they go right back to where they were. Mm -hmm. And any great musician can do that. You want to be the same way. You know it so well. Not so you can get it right, but so you can't get it wrong. Mm -hmm. That makes a difference. And then let's talk about, first we'll come to the delivery aspects. When it comes in your book, you mentioned about presentation. I, al I also have an opinion on slides, but I want to hear your take on this. Sure. I always say, please don't write the entire novel on a slide. People can read. And you don't want them looking and reading at the slides. Some of them can read faster than you instead of looking at you. Just have bullet points, keywords, just it, they all, use them as almost like a sticky note instead of, re, of saying Peter George is a... I, I never recommend that they write like that on the slides. What is your take on that? If you write on slides and read from them, you might as well just, again, send a PDF. We can read it at home or in our office just as well as we can read it in wherever you're speaking. Mm. So slides are made to support and foster your presentation. There's no such thing as a PowerPoint presentation. I hate that term. There's no such thing as a PowerPoint presentation. It doesn't decide what it's going to create for slides. It doesn't decide what order they're coming in. It doesn't decide what to, is to be said. You do. You're the presentation. They are there to just accent the presentation. So I think of like, I can see your earrings. Mm. Would you say your earrings are your main attire right now? No. No, they're an accent, right? Right. So is a slide. Oh, oh that's a good, good analogy. A slide is no more than earrings or a ring or a bracelet or a necklace. It's there to accent your presentation. So when we start, I don't even believe for the most part, 
there's always some cases, but for the most part that we should have words on slides. Why? People say, well, people are visual animals. Yes, they are, for the most part. Then put up graphics, put up a lion. You're talking about courage, and that's an old throwback, right? A, a lion for courage or, or confidence mm. uh, for reaching a goal is tried and true bullseye. There's other things you can come up with which are much more clever than those old ones. But that idea is much more important than saying goals at the top of a slide. You know, it's... And people say, and I say, why do you put up words? Well, they're visual animals. I want them to have something to look at. Two problems with that. First of all, it's a, a sentence is not visual. A sentence is an equation that must be solved. No different than a math equation. Hmm. If you look at a math equation, you'll try to solve it if of it course. pops up in front of you. Mm. Even if it's just two plus two, you're going to go four. So words are the same way. We have to read them. We have to figure out what all those little words, letters mean together. Well, that's a word. What mm -hmm. all the next little bunch of letters mean, that's a word. What's the, all those words and mean? Together, they mean something. Uh -huh. something. Now, we do that in an instant because we're used to it. And great mathematicians can do a, a, a mathematical equation very quickly. But it's still an equation. And when we solve an equation, we can't be listening. No. So when but, we're reading, we're not listening. And that's a problem. But isn't it also common knowledge that we think in pictures? We do think in pictures. We dream in pictures. We don't, we don't see Word. bullet points when we dream. And if we do, man, go see someone soon. But, <laughs> you know, we don't think we don't dream that way. Watch, I'll have a dream tonight with bullet points. But, yeah, you're right. We When we say we're visual animals, we're graphic animals. Pictures, whatever it might be, show those. I, I, had, I was working with the head of a company once. And for a specific talk. And when we got to the slides, first of all, he tried to make the slides first. I'm like, don't do that. Make the slides afterwards. Figure out after you decide what you're going to say based on the audience, the occasion, what they want and need to know and the like. Yeah. Now we put together slides. You don't go to the computer, make slides and go, okay, now I'm going to figure out what I'm going to talk about. Let's put in the cart before the horse. So, so when it came time to making the slides, he had this spreadsheet like 20 rows deep and 15 to 20 columns across. And the numbers were so small. I said, what do you, what's the point of the slide? Which is what you always want to ask yourself. What's the point of the slide? And is this helping with that point? And he said, well, I want to get across the fact that we're up 13% year over year when we expected to be up 3%. It's a great windfall. Like, so what's, what are all those numbers? The spreadsheets need, are needed to just make that one statement? Well, he, he's the head of the company. He's the CEO, but he's a finance guy. So that's how he thinks. Uh -huh. I said, Bob, but this is confusing. Where do I look? If I'm in the audience, I don't know where to look. He goes, well, then should we darken everything and highlight that and pull out the number? He still wants to keep all these numbers. Wants to keep everything up there. And I said, you could, but let's look at that. I said, how much money are we talking? And they were talking just under a billion dollars. It's a pretty mm -hmm. good sized company. Just under a billion dollars. And I said, if we're talking 900 and some odd uh, millions of dollars, do the pennies make a difference? Well, no. Okay, then let's get rid of the pennies. Let's In, make it a little easier. More things, no. We're still talking just shives. It's $983 million, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I said, does the fact that that was $872 on the end of it make a difference? Well, of course not. I would take that out. Get rid of that. So finally, we came down to uh, $980 million. 980M. Yep. I said, isn't that so much easier? He goes, yeah. I said, now what's the actual point? So that's the number you're, you hit that you weren't expecting. What's Why are we here? What's the point of this slide? that we're up 13% year over year. He goes, oh, I know what you're saying. You, sh I should have the 980 and then whatever the previous An year arrow. was under it and show the difference. And I'm like, okay, here we go with the numbers again. <laughs> and finally he said, Peter, what do you suggest? I said, Bob, if it were me, what I would have for that slide? Mm. He said, I'm not truly sure you'd need one, but to satisfy your desire for one, how about we take this big green arrow that, 
fills the slide bottom to top and half as wide, pointing up mm-hmm. with 13%, the numbers, one, three, and then the percentage Excellent. sign mm-hmm. inside the big green arrow. Mm-hmm. So now you can talk about being up 13% year over year. That's what they need to know. No one has to know 982 million over 914 million, whatever it was. No one has to know that, right? Well, no, I just want them to be jazzed up about we're up 13%. No, the arrow is much better than a spreadsheet of 20 rows. Just an arrow. And then, of course, he had their logo on the bottom. I said, Bob, why is your logo on the bottom? Well, it's our logo. I, I get that. Why is it there? Well, that's what you do. Everybody puts their logo on the bottom. They know who they work for. Get rid of the logo. Oh, it was an internal. It was an internal presentation. But even if it's an external, if I go to present to GM, they know their GM. I don't need their logo on the bottom of the slide. That's pandering. That's like, (laughs) and anything you put on a slide competes for what you're actually trying to show. So why put other, and most corporations do, by the way. You see Starbucks slides, there'll be a Starbucks logo on the bottom of every slide, GM, GM logo, whatever, because they don't know about presentation. They're looking at a graphic and you don't want that up there. You want just what you want the people to look at. You want them to look at it instantly. Mm -hmm. You do not want to be talking while they're looking at it. You want it to be a three second flashcard that they can look at and then look back at you. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, Roberta, when you're going down a street and you're looking for someone's home and you've never been there before, and all you know is the street number, and you've got the music playing, one of your favorite songs, and you're driving along, now you're getting close to the house and you have to concentrate on the the street numbers on the house. Mm -hmm. I will bet, now we've known each other for a whole half hour now, I'm willing to bet you reach over and turn down the radio so you can concentrate on the street numbers. Of course. Because no matter not... how much I love the song, I need to find the house. So let's yeah. focus on the music. Well, first of all, I always try to establish uh, which side are the even numbers, which side are the odd numbers. Right. Because I have an even number that I'm looking for. Things like that. So there's this take, taking away the focus from what I was doing before. So, and we all do that. And we even make fun of ourselves and other people when we're in the car going, really? You got to turn on the radio so you can see better? Actually, <laughs> yes. yes. Your brain does not want to get confused. So we already know for a fact that we don't want to, when we're looking at something, we don't want to hear things. We want to concentrate on what we're looking at. But many of us bring up a slide and start speaking right away. It's like, click, you'll see right here that we're up 13%. No, let them look at the slide. They'll see green arrow up 13%. Give it three seconds. Doesn't take long. Mm -hmm. Now you can start talking. They've digested that slide. Here's what somebody said in regards to that point. You already know your material. You've been preparing it. You've been rehearsing it. You already know your material. That's why you must pace yourself and remember the audience that this is their first time hearing this. Just give them time to digest. Be a little slower when you transition to the next thing. You know your stuff, so you don't just, you know, swim right through it just because. <laughs> Great, greatest thing you'll ever say is nothing. Pause and let people internalize, digest, and process what you said for the very reason you just gave. They're hearing it for the first time. You've got to pause and let them take it in. Mm-hmm. In, in my book, I actually use this idea that a gentleman who wrote another book uh, and did a great job. And when I heard how he expressed it, I wrote to him and said, I'm going, can I include this in my book? Because I've never heard it expressed better. And his idea for what we're talking about here is, wh- do you have house plants? I have plants friends. at home. <laughs> Excuse me. I have friends who do. Okay. Lots when of- they go away and come home from vacation a week later, you can imagine that the the uh, soil is hardened. Mm-hmm. Now, if they take water and just pour it on the top of the soil of a uh, hard soil of a plant, it just runs it, off. It, yeah, it doesn't absorb. Doesn't absorb. Yeah, usually, if they go away, they ask me to take care of the plants. 
but that's how I know it doesn't absorb because the soil is hard. Yeah. Right. So it just runs off. It does no good. It doesn't absorb it. However, as Joel put it so well, if you pour a little on and let it seep in and wait a few seconds and pour more on and let it seep in, now it's absorbing what's happening and it's becoming useful as mm -hmm. opposed to just running over the sides and not being useful. So to your point, say what you need to say. When you make a point, pause. Three, four, five seconds. When you ask a question, even if it's a rhetorical one, pause and let the people answer. Let the people absorb what you're saying. And when it comes to questions, a lot of us will ask a rhetorical question and then ride right over it. We'll keep talking right afterwards. You just ask people a question, even a rhetorical one. Let them answer it in their heads. Mm -hmm. And then after you've paused, keep keep talking. Sometimes it's fun to actually let them answer, even though it's rhetorical, because usually that's a, a, la a moment of laughter if you let them answer, because, yeah. It... Right. Think of a comedian. Mm -hmm. If a comedian didn't pause and let people laugh, they teach the audience not to laugh because yeah, the audience is, is the laughs, right? They, they teach the audience. If you laugh, I'm already into another joke. You'll miss it. So don't laugh. So they have to know to pause and let the audience laugh. That's why they're all there. So it's just as important to us to, when we talk, especially if we ask a question, pause and let them answer it. Otherwise you're going to teach them not to be engaged that I'm just going to ask foolish questions and keep on talking. So if it's a rhetorical or a real question, real question, you have to pause anyway to give them time to actually answer it out loud. But even a rhetorical question, pause and let them answer it in their heads. Now you're engaging people. Right. Before you go, Peter, one thing you mentioned in your book is storytelling. Mm -hmm. You can give us one tip because this is the one thing we always try to emphasize and a lot of us are still a work in progress in it to get us to tell a story that connects with the audience and bring out that emotion and it's going to be something they remember if they forget everything else we spoke about what is the one tip you can give when it comes to storytelling as part of your presentation don't tell a story relive the story and by that i mean share the conversation share the atmosphere not down to the nth degree because that'll be too much Whatever, whatever you feel is the right amount, share it. And when we share dialogue, then the characters come alive. If you're up on stage and you're speaking or in the front of a room, including a business presentation, if you're talking about someone who had a slow gait of a walk, well, then maybe you just want to walk slowly a little bit and then continue to tell the story, stop and tell the story. But bring it to life, relive the emotion. And I'll give you an example I, a client of mine speaks to high school students about making good choices. And he talks about his brother overdosing and dying. Mm. Now that's happened a while back. And when he tells that story, he's become numb to it. He's told it so long. And I think defensively too, your brother dying from an overdose, you, you build walls and everything else. What he had to eventually do was think of something else that really got to him while he was telling that story. Because let's face it, high school kids will eat you alive. There's no tougher audience in the world than high school kids, especially when you're old like he is. He's 33, by the way. Mm -hmm. So, But to a high school kid, that's double their age. <laughs> so, so he's an old guy to them. And he has to relive that story. He has to bring that emotion forward. If he tells that story without a quiver in his voice and without... Uh, tears in his eyes that will not relate with those kids and it's not that he's acting mm -hmm. but he is he knows he's got to feel that way and transmit that feeling so he relives it he finds a way to relive it and have that emotion come to the forefront so whether it's a happy story or a sad story relive it and when we're telling it we tell it roberto let's do this peter no let's let's do that as opposed to he said, Roberta, let's mm -hmm. do this. 
And then Roberta said, and Roberta Peter, said let's do this. Well, that gets a little old after a while. Peter, let's do this. No, thanks, Roberta. We know who's talking now. We know who they're addressing. Hmm. That's what you want to do. And always, always, always have conflict. An anecdote differs from a story in that an anecdote generally doesn't have conflict. It's a cute little story, whether it's funny or not. Mm -hmm. It's a little story. It might have meaning to it, but a story has conflict. For a hundred years or more, Hollywood's been doing boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl in the end, they live happily ever after. Right. If boy didn't lose girl, it would be boy meets girl, they live and happily they live ever after. Home. And the movie's 10 minutes. And and nothing to it. We didn't go on an emotional ride. Mm -hmm. Now, when we see a movie like that, we know they're getting together in the end. But we like the conflict in between. We the want, twist. Right. Yeah. And, and we want to see how it was resolved. Right. Star Wars. Let's take the, ori the original Star Wars, A New mm -hmm. Hope. Luke didn't even know at the beginning that he was going to be involved in this quest. Mm -hmm. But once he did... His first problem was his uncle wanted him to work on the farm. He wanted to go to the academy. So there's conflict. Right. Then he finds out his uncle and aunt were killed. There's greater conflict. And then he doesn't know what he's going to do, but then he's going to fight the empire. Well, how is he going to do that? He doesn't know anything about it, doesn't know anything about it. The force doesn't know anything about anything. Thankfully, as a mentor. Mm -hmm. But still, how are we going to get to the uh, planet we want to get to where the rebellion forces are? They had to overcome that. That's when they met Han Solo. There were conflicts all along the way, including the inter internal conflicts. I'm not good enough for this. I'm not a fighter. I don't know if I can do this. I'm going to let the rebellion down. Conflict, conflict, conflict all along the way. And how did he overcome each one of those? Mm -hmm. That's a story. Now, it might just be one thing of conflict. One little incident of conflict, but there has to be conflict. Show how it's resolved. Most of all, it has to relate to your point. You can't just tell a story because it's a good story, and people go, "Yeah, but what's that got to do with the price of gas?" We'll about today, yeah. It's so it's got to relate, but then at the end, there's the moral. Mm -hmm. Now, if you tell a story extremely well, people will get the moral. Here's the problem with that, though, at least in my eyes. What if I didn't hear 100%? Someone next to me might have been coughing or something, or I might have been daydreaming or whatever. I might not get the same moral you want me to. And then it doesn't make sense to your whole presentation, or at least that point. What if uh, what if you, I didn't tell the story well that day? So my moral didn't come across, obviously. Always tell people the moral of the story. Okay. Think of the t the tortoise and the hare. At the end of fables like that, and the moral of the story is slow and steady wins the race. Right. There was always a moral, and it was told to us a lot because I think we were kids. But there are other reasons we might not come up with the right moral. Tell us the moral of the story. Now, you can actually say the moral of the story is or what that it's means to you here today. And say it. What that means to you going forward is, that's the moral. Mm -hmm. Tell them the moral of the story. Stories are fascinating. Yeah. And fun. Everybody loves them. Yeah, of course. And we remember them forever. Like I said, sometimes they don't remember what I said, but the story is something. Stories are sticky. Card. Yeah. Stories are sticky. Right. I mean. We can be 40, 50, 60 years old and remember nursery rhymes. We might not get them perfect. I remember the stories my grandma used to tell us when we were kids, and I'm 46. Right? <laughs> so, yeah, you, you didn't hear them in four, in four decades. And maybe you couldn't tell them exactly how your grandmother told them, but mm. you'll come down close. The moral I remember, yes. Yeah, right? I don't think I could tell you the three little pigs perfectly, but how hard is it? A house of sticks, a house of straw, a house of bricks, and Every a wolf. Go the wolf. <laughs> right. So we remember the essence, mm. we, like you said, and you remember the moral. Right. Tell stories. Peter, George, thank you so much for being here today. Now, before you go, please give us words of wisdom, something that you feel like I should have asked and, and we 
we didn't mention. Well, we touched upon this in a lot of different things, in a lot of different ways. But to say it straight out, always remember this. It's all about the audience. Everything you do as a presenter, business, speaker, on stage, or anywhere in between, it's always about the audience. Keep that in the forefront of your mind. You can't go wrong. Words of wisdom from Peter George, the public speaker and public speaking coach, award-winning author of The Captivating Speaker. Thank you so much for being with us today. Now, before you go, please tell us where we can find you on the socials. Easiest way to do it is to go to my website, which is petergeorgepublicspeaking.com. petergeorgepublicspeaking.com. From there, they can find me, uh, social media, my book on Amazon, whatever they need, what I do for coaching and the like, they can find right there. Excellent. Peter George, public speaking .com, public speaking coaching. Okay. Peter George, public speaking .com. Sorry, Peter George, public speaking .com for all the socials and also get the book from Amazon, the captivating speaker. Thank you so much for being on our show today. Thank you, Roberta. This has been a blast. I've really enjoyed it. And can I say before I leave? Yes, please do. You are the epitome of a podcast host. Thank you very much. This is an honor coming from you. Thank you so much. You are awesome. You made you you made you made it easy. I I appreciate that. I really enjoyed talking with you. And more than anything, thank you so much for sharing these nuggets with us. I think the more that I listen to experts like you, the better public speaker I become as well. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Don't forget to subscribe, give a rating and a review, and we'll be with you next time.